Hey guys, in this week's episode, we're going to hear Chris's top 10 films of all time. But before that, we're going to talk about Nathan for You, The Clone Wars Season 7, and whatever else has been on our mind. So join us. Beautiful. <laughs> Cinecast, powered by Cinelinks. My name is Chris, and with me as always is a man who's looking forward to the canonical top 10 list of the casual Cinecast because they're mine. Mike, how you doing today? Mm. Well, <laughs> much like the Holy Bible, canonical can change and be debated. And yeah, so... That got real deep Whoa. real fast. Yeah, it's deep, <laughs> strong, I mean, that's... strong things. <laughs> 30 seconds into the I can use the Star Wars canon instead. Is that a little yeah. less deep for you guys? <laughs> that works. It's not okay. too deep uh, for me. I'm just worried about <laughs> other people's opinions. <laughs> We're going to get hate mail. Yeah. And also, a man who doesn't want hate mail. Justin, how are you doing today? I'm doing good. You've readied me to just be contrary to every movie that you pick. Everything you list, <laughs> I'm just going to be like, yeah, it's okay. <laughs> well, yeah, that, that, I figured that was the reaction to start off with, so... Yeah. Well, there you go. Yeah. You got it. <laughs> All right. If this is your first time listening to the show, this is kind of a special episode. The past couple of weeks during this quarantine, Justin had the bright idea to do our top 10 films of all time. So each host has basically had an entire episode dedicated to their top 10. So far, two of them are out. Mine... Uh, was last week and then Justin's was the week before that so if you are interested in our top 10 films uh, go back a couple in your feed and check them out but this episode is dedicated to Chris yay yeah hello Chris are you ready to talk about your top 10 films of all time it's all I've thought about all day my palms are sweaty Good. and so I might change like your knees real weak. quick my, and my knees are weak I'm eating mom's spaghetti yeah I don't know <laughs> well we all know okay anyway <laughs> is, that, is you, this a preview to one of your favorite movies maybe yeah. Spoiler are we giving stuff away 10. right now <laughs> yeah. um so anyways normally we like to talk about new movies that are in theaters and then alternate between criterion collection movies in episodes that we call casually criterion but the pandemic is happening right now everyone's aware of that and there's no new movies in theaters and we've done a good amount of criterion lately so uh, we're doing this to spice things up a bit. Yeah. And then next week, we'll be back to the Criterions because we're out of hosts to do top 10 films about for now. Yeah. For now. All right. So if you have any opinions on our top 10s, uh, Chris's, mine, or Justin's, or if you have any suggestions on the format of the show, or you never want to hear these types of episodes again or more frequently, whatever. Uh, Justin, where can they contact us? They can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Casual Cinecast. They can also email us at casualcinemedia at gmail.com. And if they want to be extra nice after emailing us or contacting us there, they can go onto iTunes, give us a five-star review. It will help other people find the show and let them know that uh, it's a good show that they should be listening to. So I guess we should go ahead and get into News on the March. What do you guys say? The yeah! Sooner the sooner we do that, the sooner Chris has to name his top 10 films. And I know. I'm he's ready been, to. He's been avoiding hate on this them. for a long time. <laughs> All my life. You on the mark! All right, Justin. Yes, sir. What you been up to this week, man? Not a ton of interesting things. I've watched a few movies. I've watched some episodes of TV, like shows that we've talked about the last couple of weeks that I've been catching up on. But mm -hmm. there's really only one thing that that really stood out to me is worth talking about uh, that I watched. And that was uh, over the weekend, I watched the series finale of the TV show Nathan for You from Comedy Central. Yeah, I've heard of this. The show or the, the season finale, the series finale? <laughs> Both, I guess. Um, <laughs> I I knew that it was a show and then it wasn't a show that was current anymore, so I knew it had to have a season finale ah, or a series okay. finale. Okay, cool. So <laughs> I have not actually watched the rest of Nathan for you. I've seen a couple of episodes, a couple of segments from it here and there that have been you know like shared on Facebook or Twitter or whatever. But I was doing some researching uh, on documentaries. I was in the mood for a documentary over the weekend. 
And I came across some list on Letterbox of like 200 fantastic documentaries or something like that. Um, this probably had a better, catchier title. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> on this on this documentary list, uh, I came across Nathan for You, Finding Francis, which is the name of this series finale. And as it turns out, instead of the usual like 30-minute episode and the usual concept of the show, which the normal concept is that he is a guy who makes suggestions for struggling businesses, but those suggestions are really off the wall and like weird and lead to a lot of awkward, uncomfortable situations. Um, <laughs> for example, he tries to help a frozen yogurt shop that's struggling and gets them to introduce a uh, poop flavored uh, frozen yogurt because it will make news and get them on the map, uh, even though it's terrible. <laughs> <laughs> and they legitimately do this. Uh, but anyways, uh, so finding Francis it is actually, it's an hour and a half episode. So it's like a feature length documentary, basically. And it follows him and a previous character from one of the previous episodes, who is a Bill Gates impersonator, who he had found out this guy had this long lost love that he hadn't talked to in over 50 years. And he's just you know, that's like his biggest regret of his life. And he just wishes he could find her. And he has no idea who to find her, how to find her, how to look her up because he's kind of this awkward old guy, but her name is Francis. So for this last episode, Nathan sets out on the goal of trying to help him find his long lost love, which to me, I was like, well, that sounds interesting and really different from what I've seen of that show. And it was on this list. So I, g I gave it a watch and I thought it was really fantastic like I really, really enjoyed it. I think uh, Nathan Fielder's funny. I don't know if uh, everybody who doesn't find him funny would uh, like this documentary, but I do. So it was working for me. It was really funny and also kind of, kind of like poignant at times and a little bit moving. And uh, it's a bit of a roller coaster because like at times this guy's journey goes from being really sweet and you feel for him uh, to being kind of creepy that they're searching for this girl and like the links that they go to, to kind of search for her yeah. and some of his attitudes about women in general, like it gets a little questionable, but that's part of like the documentary and part of like the experience of Nathan for you is like humor built out of people being in really awkward situations. So there's a bit of that too. Have either of you guys seen Nathan for you or like, like the show or have seen this? Yeah, I enjoyed the show. Um, I haven't watched all of them, but, you know, I would kind of the same as you. I would catch them here and there. And I, I enjoyed the Nathan Fielder, um, like, type of comedy. He's, like, so dry and kind of leaves you questioning, like, how real is this, you know, type of thing. Uh, but, yeah, I, I enjoy it. Uh, no, I haven't. I've heard of it, and I've heard good things. But just kind of naturally, I tend to avoid um like a lot of like reality type tv or like documentary type tv for the sheer you know fact what chris just mentioned the fact that like most of it doesn't seem real and it isn't but i don't know about this show i'm just speaking like kind of generally so unless i hear a lot of really good stuff about a show i tend to just kind of avoid it unless it's like a like a, an actual like um ongoing show that i'm going to keep watching with like a, a narrative you know sure and i think if this show wasn't done for humor like if it was a real reality show, then, it, you know, I would agree with you. Like I don't watch any of the other like people going to help other business shows or um, that sort of reality TV. But since this is done for comedy to like kind of yeah in a sort of candid camera way, except that I guess the people know they're on camera, um, <laughs> watch people put in awkward positions and like uncomfortable positions and given like do weird, you, crazy advice. Do you get the sense that it's real or if it's like a like a... What was that show that Bam Margera used to have on MTV? Viva La Bam? Yeah. You know, like, and you get the sense that like no. absolutely nothing on that was real. It's made to be like a documentary, but like it's just a bunch of staged scenarios. Does does Nathan for you feel like that or does it feel like I don't think so because okay. it's not like that show where it's supposed to be like get a glimpse of the the life of Bam Margera and his like jackass friends. It's yeah, like, that's I only use that show because that's how out of touch I am with current TV. I couldn't think of a better example. <laughs> yeah, this is more <laughs> along the lines of something like Borat or Bruno, like the Sasha Baron yeah. Cohen. Type, so still pretty type fake of, feeling, but more like ground and real footage, I guess. Yeah, and the the people's reactions are real. I think the they take 
unsuspecting people and putting them in, put them in like but crazy scenarios. With those, I always get the reaction. I always get this, like the sneaking suspicion that the reaction I'm seeing is not a legitimate reaction to the thing that I just saw on TV. You know what I mean? It's like an edit, like in in like the Borat Bruno oh, situation. Sure. Yeah, I mean it's fun with editing. I mean I, I think you could get bogged down in that or you could kind of just enjoy the humor if you want to i think sure. the thing about this documentary though is that it's very different from the other episodes right like it, this is legitimately it sounds like a movie he's yeah he's legitimately trying to help this guy find him some of the methods in which he tries to like search him out like he he holds a fake high school reunion for <laughs> for the high school class that she was in the the graduating class that's funny. And he has the guy impersonate one of their um one of their classmates because he didn't go to the same school as her, so he wouldn't be at the reunion. <laughs> so he impersonates like some guy and pretends to be this guy that they all knew in order to start asking questions of like, "Hey, do you remember Francis? Like what happened to her? Do you know her?" <laughs> See if they could get any information. And um that's obviously it's it's a pretty silly funny situation. So there's like there's a lot of humor in it, but it is I don't know. It's a very interesting, interesting place for the show to go. Like, I don't know. I I, I think that I, I had I had the same problem as you, Mike. Like that, I was like, I don't know how much of this is real, and I don't know what is it's doing for the camera. But I think by the end of the show, they also call that out, which I find very interesting. Like the the very last thing that happens in this documentary is a bit of like blurring that line between reality and film and making the show and i think it's kind of making a statement about that too so it feels a little bit more poignant a little bit more self-aware and nice. making a point about the type of humor and the type of show that he's doing so by the end i think it felt like a a journey that paid off and didn't just feel like this only works if I believe every word of this is true. Right. Yeah. And then, you know, it's not just like TV. I have that problem. Well, I guess this is still TV, but like I have that problem with like the Netflix documentaries that come out every year that, you know, like, like I've watched a couple episodes of Tiger King and I'm just like, yeah, okay. You know, <laughs> or like the making a murderer or the fire festival one, or it's like all these documentaries that come out and then, you know, a week later after they're popular, all this information comes out about how everything's just not how you're supposed to, like, it's not represented accurately. And I don't know, it, it, all that stuff is just kind of always rubs me the wrong way with documentaries. But that's also kind of the appeal because taking that kind of footage and assembling a narrative is, you know, an art form all its own, I guess. But yeah, I think that's kind of what's interesting about Nathan for you, though, is because I don't like where Tiger King or, you know, making a murder presupposes that their story is real and actual as opposed right. to building a narrative. Nathan for you is like having a, having a go and knows that it's not supposed to be well, real. Like, right. It, and I haven't seen it, so I don't know, but like, it reminds me of like that show on comedy central. I used to watch a long time ago called insomniac with David tell. Oh yeah. Yeah. Where he would go yeah. around supposedly in one night and uh, <laughs> visit all these like locations, you know, uh, right. and like unique cities. And then like he would stay up all night. And then by the end of it, the sun would come up and you know, that would be the, the premise of the show. And he'd move on to the, you know, a new thing next week. But really, it was filmed over like multiple nights and everyone could tell that. Yeah. <laughs> it seems like that's the kind of thing where it's like when it's a comedy show, like it sounds like Nathan for you mostly is. I, I care about that stuff less. Yeah. Well, cool. Well, if you get a chance, I, I think even if you aren't interested in the rest of the Nathan for you show, this documentary series finale, Finding Francis, is something totally different. And where could you watch it? We're, it's on Hulu. It's like like it has all the Nathan for you episodes. This is just literally the last episode of the Nathan for you uh, uh, on the last episode wrong of season to watch four. Just the last episode though. <laughs> it, it does, but it's also, it's, there's no like overarching narrative other than like this guy appeared in one previous episode. Like you might could watch that episode. Right. And, uh, <laughs> and get all you need, but they also fill that in. So it, it basically, it works as its own little documentary that I think is, uh, is worthwhile. It's worth checking out. Cool. So yeah, but that's, that's really the only thing of note that I can think of that I watched. So we can move on from Nathan for you finding Francis. <laughs> so Mike, what have you watched? Yeah. Well, like you, I'm in the middle of a whole bunch of stuff right now. I haven't watched a whole lot. That's like really worth talking about yet, but I will say that the clone wars season seven on Disney plus, and it just started its last 
arc. Like they have like little like four episode arcs generally, you know? So there's been two arcs so far. And now we're on like the the final episode or the final like the first episode of the final arc of the series. And it's actually gotten to the point where it's overlapping with Revenge of the Sith, like episode three. So <laughs> like um in the, it's really cool actually. Like the scene that just happened in the last episode. Uh I guess spoilers if you don't want to know anything about this, but it's pretty vague. Most people probably don't remember, but if you remember how episode three starts, it starts with like a big space battle mm -hmm. and they're they're going to stop like a um, a kidnapping of Chancellor Palpatine. And so episode whatever of this se uh, series in the middle of the episode, you actually see them get called away to that kidnapping. And so it's taking place concurrently with it. And you're seeing the kind of the same events from like a different point of view. And the rest of the series is going to be basically... Revenge of the Sith from other characters' points of view. And it's pretty cool how they did that. It's kind of like one of those things where it's like the Clone Wars, if you can get into it. I It took me a long time to really get into that show because it's the first couple seasons are kind of rough. Yeah. <laughs> um, but once I finally was able to get into it, it really does help take the rough edges out of some of the questionable storytelling decisions <laughs> in the prequels. So anyways, uh, I just wanted to say that real quick, if you don't ever watch the show at all, I would suggest just watching this most recent episode because it feels like this um, this last arc is going to try to be like um, a standalone movie, like episode 3.5 kind of thing. And mm -hmm. there's a lot of recaps and stuff. So even if you don't watch The Clone Wars, I would suggest just watching maybe this most recent episode because the animation is beautiful now that they have uh, Disney money behind them. <laughs> that's all it takes. Yeah, right. But anyway, that's <laughs> it really is just that little episode. Just wanted to keep it brief, but I just thought it was really cool because uh, as the resident Star Wars nerd on the podcast. Uh... <laughs> so I've watched like several different like arcs, I guess is what you're calling them. Like the ah Ahsoka, isn't that her name? Yes. Ahsoka uh, like, Tano, her... Anakin's uh, apprentice. That right. was not in the movies at all. <laughs> right. Uh, but I've watched like her arc and stuff like that. Could I pick up, but I haven't seen all of the Clone Wars. Do you think I could start at the beginning of season seven and be okay? Yeah, I think you could. If anything, maybe... Like there is actually um, on Disney Plus on the app, there is like a 20 episode um, list called The Essential Clone Wars. Oh, Ooh. it's like it's 20 episodes out of all six previous seasons. And I think it's primarily focusing on Ahsoka, Maul and um, one of the clones named Rex. And I think those are the, the main people that you need to concern yourself with in season seven. OK, interesting. Yeah, yeah, like because like a lot of the Clone Wars is it's so bulky because it's like all right now here's an episode of like arc of like C three PO Jar Jar Binks and R two D two going to like some planet to do something and you're like oh, okay <laughs> I could skip this ultimately in the grand scheme of things but the whole show is about is the story of Ahsoka and Rex yeah. essentially right. cool I'll have to give that a shot yeah I, I suggest it because the animation in season seven is just so beautiful like I used to think the Clone Wars was a really ugly show and it still is in the earlier seasons. But even the things that, like, I don't like about it, like some of the character models and how Obi-Wan Kenobi looks like a nutcracker, like, <laughs> that <laughs> is even still better uh, with the with the, the new animation and stuff in Season 7. So, yeah, check it out. I, I think it's pretty good. Nice. I like the, the condensed version because I've definitely tried to watch Clone Wars back when it was on Netflix, before Disney Plus existed. Mm -hmm. And uh, I made it a couple of episodes in and couldn't really convince myself to keep watching. So, having, like, a... Well, it's weird be it's because like, it's out of order it's not even in chronological order like the episode listing because i don't know why but first of all watching it I, like in order helps <laughs> yeah yeah I, I think i read like george lucas wanted it to be like the newsreels you know like that you'd watch during world war ii mm -hmm. when you go to the cinema so it'd always be out of order and that's kind of what he was going for uh i i don't necessarily agree with that choice though yeah bold i've heard that and i've also heard that it wasn't really their decision but because uh, like Around season three, I think that stops or like it starts to go mostly like 95% in chronological order. Yeah. But like there's the first three seasons are just like weird mess of out of order stuff. But um, yeah, definitely if you're if you even have like a passing interest in this and you don't want to watch the bulk of the Clone Wars, which you by any means do not need to do <laughs> because there's a lot of crap in there. But there's some also <laughs> some like some of the best Star Wars is in the Clone Wars also. Sweet. Interesting. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah. So, anyways, uh, yeah, that's all I really wanted to talk about. So, yeah, are we ready to move into Chris's top ten? Yeah. Wait, let me change it. 
real quick. I got to change my list. <laughs> okay, we'll wait. Yeah. That time has passed, sir. You're out of time. <laughs> oh, no. We're not waiting, Justin. We're plowing ahead. <laughs> um, okay. <laughs> All right, Chris, the time is here. I'm going to gently toss it to you now to start out with your top 10 films of all time. Underhanded. Underhanded. I, I appreciate that. A gentle Things, lob about gentle shoulder lob. height. <laughs> well, I appreciate it. You're welcome. Uh, I guess, first off, I kind of wanted to talk about the list. And a lot of this, like, you guys kind of talked about how, you know, your prerequisites were... Like, you'd watch the movie three or more times and things like that, and that's certainly part of my list making, but also, I think kind of what I was going for, like, movies that kind of changed how I thought about movies uh, to a certain extent and mean a lot to me. So, some of it is kind of navel gazy because they mean a lot to me. It's not necessarily that the movie is super great, but it just meant something to me at the time, and every time I go back and revisit it, it continues to mean something to me if that makes sense to you guys so that's just my preamble uh to this list um, it makes it makes so much sense that i already know one of the movies that you're gonna have on your list <laughs> i think you both do there's at least one that you guys know what it's gonna be yeah based but, on that preamble yeah yeah <laughs> i think sallow <laughs> damn it mike let me <laughs> at least be able to say it yeah i gotta at least get to number romeo yeah. and michelle's high school reunion <laughs> <laughs> yes all right so my first film is a movie that i watched like back when i was in high school i got a tv in my room it was one of those tvs that had the, yeah those knobs so like you had to like turn it by hand like uh because some old tv that somebody didn't want anymore and they mm. just gave it to me and so uh, oftentimes <laughs> at night i would like flip through channels looking for different things to watch and there was this one movie and oftentimes i would just flip channels like i would never stay on any one thing in particular i would just kind of flip through and see what's going on right uh except for this one time where i watched this one movie and it riveted me <laughs> you know uh the movie is duel steven spielberg's duel nice uh, i figured um, that's where this was going yeah yeah i think i probably told you guys that story before yep. um but there's a lot of like Jaws in this movie, you know, it's like, and it's probably not as good as Jaws, but for me, when I watched this as a kid, uh, I was just riveted to it. And the fact that you never see the trucker's face the whole time you watch this movie, you know, I guess I should tell you the, the movie's just about, it's a real simple movie. It's about this guy that, and it's actually a made for TV movie too. So that's kind of unique. And I think our selections is probably the only one that was a made for TV movie, but it's about this guy. He's going home to visit, to see his family. He's like a traveling salesman and he passes this giant like diesel truck and the diesel truck spends the rest of the movie chasing him down. And it's really great and suspenseful and just edge of your seat, uh, heart beating fast movie. And I, I loved it as a kid and like ever since then, every time I go past a truck, I try to make sure I can see the driver's face in order to not get chased down. So yeah, uh, that <laughs> is my number 10 pick. Uh, have, have you both seen this or have either of you seen it? I actually have never seen this. Yeah, I never have. This is the first film on these lists that I have not seen. Okay, well, I uh, completely recommend that you guys watch it. I I would assume so if it's your, on your list. Of <laughs> yeah, top um, ten. I I don't know that it's as good as Jaws, but for me, it, it just meant something when I watched it that first time. And like I remember talking to my dad about it afterwards. And he's like, "Oh yeah, I remember that movie." And you know, like, yeah, it's <laughs> really something special for me. Well, when I, I mean, it. you're not alone in that. I've heard this movie talked about a few times actually. Like my dad was talking about this movie the other day, and like I said, I've never seen it, but I remember you told me the story of you watching it like a long time ago like, like yeah like a decade ago and uh, i was able to actually like tell my dad the name of the movie he was thinking of because you told me <laughs> <laughs> about this movie and i just remembered you telling me about it so if i ever i guess just run across it i'll probably definitely watch it because it's always been like on the forefront of my mind or at least the back of my mind maybe not the forefront but <laughs> well yeah, if you guys watch it, I, I'd be really eager to hear what you have to say. Maybe we can talk about it like in News on the March at some point. Or maybe it'll become a Criterion film and we can talk about it then. <laughs> right. Or if this is the only film that none of us have seen, maybe we should just do a full review of it at some point. That's true. It's on our top 10 list. I, yeah, I, I was think about you to guys say, have just, seen it. 
I was about to say, because it's the only film uh, that I haven't seen out of all so far out of all of our top tens, it makes me want to like prioritize it above yeah. everything else. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So far. We'll see. Yeah. We'll see what happens. Yeah, Chris um, is just trying to make us look embarrassed. <laughs> all right. So my number nine movie is a movie that I watched uh, very early on as well. Um, it's Train Spotting. <laughs> Uh, I really love this movie. This is one of those movies, like I grew up fairly sheltered, like I've said before, and I I didn't watch a lot of crazy movies as a kid, you know, like a lot of simple movies, as you'll see later on in my list, what movies, like kind of movies I had watched on a consistent basis. Trainspotting was one that as soon as Ewan McGregor crawls into that toilet, I was like, oh. (laughs) <laughs> this this is something completely different that I've never seen before, yeah. and I want to see more of it. And and it and it gets weirder and crazier from that. And then on top of that, I I love like uh, like he's got this great monologue at the very end. You know, it's like uh, you know just choose a job, choose a career, choose life. You know, like and it's it's really for a heroine story, pretty life affirming. And it's also I think my first Danny Boyle film, and uh, he's hit or miss, but like when he's on. I love his movies, you know, like they're better than anything. I agree. And personally speaking, I think Danny Boyle is more hits than misses, but he's got some misses in there. Have you ever seen uh, Train Spotting 2 or T2? I have not. And part of that's because Train Spotting is so special to me. I don't want to ruin it. Have you I guys like seen it? it? Do I, you? I, I like Train Spotting 2. Interesting. It's not as I, good, but it's good. Yeah, I have always been kind of like, I like, I've liked Train Spotting, but not enough to like seek out the sequel unless someone else has wanted to watch it. So I never, I never watched it, but also maybe if I liked it more, I probably wouldn't want to watch the second either, <laughs> you know? Yeah. I guess for well, me, it was like, I was more curious just because it had good reviews. Train spotting too. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it's because like when they make a sequel to something that's so beloved, like train spotting, it's almost just like, I was so curious. Um, every time they do that and they manage to pull off like the, the sequel decades later that, seems to like stand up on its own and uh, justify its own existence. That's like um, something that's so rare that I always find it fascinating. Like Blade Runner 2049 or I don't know. Can you think um, of another one that does Dr. that? Dr. Sleep. Uh, Ewan McGregor yeah. also yeah. is in that. So yeah. Dr. Sleep. This is kind of a similar thing. Yeah. 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 So I, I really love that movie and uh, I'm ready to move on to number eight. Oh, well, oh uh, real, real quick. quick. I- oh. Oh, yeah, ahead, I have something to say about train spotting. Also, I just wanted yeah, to say the baby scene. Yes, the baby scene and the toilet scene you described earlier are the two things that I never forgot. Oh, <laughs> and also uh, the poo scene, the cat poop. Yeah, no, 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 the human poop. Was it human poop in that room? No, um, after the one night stand with that. Oh, well, yeah, not yeah, Ewan yeah. McGregor's character. Interesting. Yeah, yeah I have a giant fear of like public restrooms and stuff. I don't really like using them or going into them. So the movie, if I remember correctly, <laughs> starts off with the the scene that you already mentioned, Chris, about like the, the dirtiest toilet in all of wherever the movie was set. I can't mm-hmm. remember what it was called. <laughs> but uh, that that pretty much grossed me out very <laughs> early on. And then I was just kind of like irked to the rest of the movie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's unsettling. So it yeah, maybe that colored my experience of it, like my initial viewing, where I didn't like, I wasn't like super captivated or blown away. But I, I've watched it again since, and it's certainly, it's certainly good. I like it a lot. I just have to kind of avert my just, eyes during that one scene. Yeah, just fast forward through that scene. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Good number All nine. Right. Thank you. All right, so uh, we're moving on to number eight, and this is a movie that, like. I read the book before I watched the movie. And, you know, once again, all of these are like when I was of a certain age. And um, so the lead up to this movie was like a big deal. It was a big summer blockbuster. I read the book first and it was I remember going with my dad and I remember being scared of watching this movie because I I was afraid that I was going to be scared the whole time. And uh, like just the build up to it and the suspense before I even went into the movie, I was worried about being scared. So that is kind of where this movie leads up to. And that is, you're going to laugh at me when I tell you the name of it. But it's another Steven Spielberg movie. It's Jurassic Park. Nice. Nice. Yeah. yeah. I saw that in theaters. Uh, that was fun. Me too. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I was so proud of myself because I wasn't that scared. And I don't think it's that scary of a <laughs> movie, job. to be honest. But like, uh, 
But one of the things I love about this movie is the awe. Like, I think how I'm going to talk about this movie is a lot like older people talk about King Kong. You know, like when you watch people talk about King Kong or like in their little synopsises that they give before the movie comes on or whatever, like... There's this awe to Jurassic Park when they first get to the island uh, of the majesty of these dinosaurs and the the fact that they've actually done this and created these dinosaurs that like, if it had it just been a dinosaur movie killing people, it, it wouldn't be worth it. But like, because there's this sense of majesty in uh, the creation of these dinosaurs, it really, uh, I don't know, like I get goosebumps, uh, like listening to the music. Um so yeah, yeah, this is a movie I love. I'm sure you guys do too. Oh yeah, um, this is probably one of my earliest memories in a movie theater. I don't remember what my first memory in a movie theater is, but this is one of them. Mm-hmm. Um, I remember very clearly being like four years old, five years old, something like that, and the kitchen scene just blowing my mind. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and then I remember <laughs> lots of action figures in my day. <laughs> Yeah, did you have the little dinosaur T-Rex that had the chunk you could pull out of it? That it yeah, exposed, all the, like, all the dinosaurs red... had the little chunk that you could pull out of it for some reason. Oh, okay. Well, like, like, I guess I, 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 I think I only had, had the T-Rex. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they had the T-Rex, and there's also like uh, little velociraptors as well. And triceratops. Mm-hmm. Anyway, yeah, great movie. Great kids movie, great family movie, just, yeah, like the gold yeah. standard. Yeah, I think there's just something about the combination of that score and that moment when you yes. first see the dinosaurs that and and the shot like of the jeep and and um sam neil that's right is that that's the actor's name right yeah sam, yeah, sam neil yeah. standing up out of the top of the jeep like looking it's just like really iconic moment in cinema maybe that's just for me but i think maybe in general it's just it's really perfect and i think jeff goldblum is kind of like a cult hit performance with this movie, even though the movie's not a cult movie. Yeah, his performance <laughs> is really great in this. And Samuel L. Jackson, really young. Yeah, I, I went to see this when I went on a trip with a couple of friends to Chicago. We went to like a late night screening of this. And the by far, like the most quoted person, like people would like quote along with the movie was Jeff Goldblum. Like they, the, all the people in the theater knew all of his lines. <laughs> And it's just kind of yeah. like, it's this interesting, iconic performance. <laughs> is, it, is it right to call it a cult performance, kind of? Because I feel like it wasn't that until recently. I don't know. I mean, Jeff Goldblum is kind of like the Christopher Walken. Like, he just kind of becomes like a parody of himself and a character all his own as he gets older. Right. Yeah. I th- and I think that's it. It's just now he's he's Jeff Goldblum. He's like a meme, you know? Yeah. So, like, so yeah. But that that's super fun in it. And <laughs> Laura Dern, as always. Yeah, yeah, Laura Dern's she, really great. She's great in it. I also want to underline um, how much the score means to this film, because that's a you brought it up earlier. But the score, without the score, that's just so beautiful, and I, I think the score is what makes it awe inspiring and and uh, raises it up to a level uh, beyond what's on the frame. You know, like uh, John Williams um, can do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've definitely. I've had a, a, I shoot weddings, you know, and I've had a few brides walk down the aisle to the Jurassic Park theme song, like a, like an orchestral or, or like a little bit slower version of it or something um, where you're kind of like, oh, wait a minute, this is Jurassic Park. <laughs> wow. <laughs> and it works really well. Like, and to the point where like, it does take you a minute because it just works so well and it like fits the moment somehow. And then mm-hmm. you're like, oh wait, I know this. Okay, here we go. Yeah, weird. Yeah. That's crazy. Yeah, I would never imagine somebody walking down the aisle to uh, Jurassic Park. They do move in herds. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. <Yeah. laughs> All right. Number seven is another one that has a great score. And when I first watched this, it came out, my friend was working at the movie theater, so we got to go watch this like the night before it came out or something like that. And uh, there's an actor in this movie. Uh, I guess I'll just tell you, it's it's Truman Show. And when I first went and saw this movie, I was not expecting what I got. I was expecting something uh, a lot sillier, a lot goofier. And in mm-hmm. fact, when I first watched this, <laughs> you know, I was like laughing at the weirdest moments because like 
there's all these different weird camera angles because he's being filmed as he walks across the island and it's like these really awkward placement of cameras and I, mm-hmm. I do think it's funny but i was laughing because i thought i was supposed to be laughing you know and then somewhere about a third of the way through the movie i stopped laughing um and not because it's not funny but because i got into the story and i um like really got invested into what was going on last week mike you said something about one of your favorite things to watch is somebody realizing that like their whole life everything that they believed in their life was a lie or like having basically their foundation of their belief their foundational beliefs like torn out from underneath them and that's this to me this movie is that you know oh yeah i mean like uh, it, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> can't get any more than that. <laughs> the score is really great by uh, Philip Glass. And then it also just has like this uh, Chopin um, piano score that every time I hear it now, I just think of Truman Show. <laughs> you know, like uh, most of these movies on my top 10 list, I bought the score to. That's kind of like another prerequisite. Like if I bought the score, it should probably be on my top 10 <laughs> list, you know. <laughs> but yeah, there, there's just this like this moment. And I think everybody's where he is standing in front of the bus and everything stops around him and in the score and everything works so well together that it like, it's another goosebump moment, you know, like uh, as he realizes that the world he thinks he knows isn't quite there. And it, it's so great. And, you know, we talked about Jim Carrey, like he was on Justin's list twice. And in this movie, he does such a great job of like walking that fine line of like doing serious acting and he can go over the top in Truman show, but it works because this, you know, this character is having a mental breakdown. And so it, Jim Carrey being cast in this role, like kind of cements uh, like how great the movie is because of the way he can walk that line. Like he can go over the top and then bring it back and then, you know, go back over the top if he needs to. And it just, to me, it works so well um, I know well, in the... He, oh, I'm Go sorry. Ahead. Go ahead. You were going to say something. I, can oh, I was just up. saying, Jim Carrey, like the quality he has in that movie is like he can make the like seeing a man on the verge of a mental breakdown likable and charming. <laughs> yeah. He's like Jimmy <laughs> Stewart. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Somewhere I read in the making of this, like it got delayed. And so Peter Weir and the writer and uh, they all kind of got together and just built this world out. And so... A lot of times delays are are not good for films, but I think in this situation they they built this world out in a way that it's so believable. Like people get sick, you know, in the Truman Show, but they're really just going on vacation, you know. And then I also really really love Ed Harris's performance, and I think oftentimes he gets overlooked. But Ed Harris's performance in this as like this maniacal god or father figure to Truman is is layered and subtle, you know, and I think it's a really good performance from him. Um, I agree. Ed Harris is awesome. Yeah. Ed Harris is awesome in everything, but yeah, I, and I think Laura Linney is really good in this as the, the wife. And uh, yeah, I just, again, she's always awesome. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's true. It's, this is a stack cast. Um, I mean, she carries, so, well, that's not true. She doesn't carry Jay, like, a lot of people carry Ozark. It's a well acted show, but I'm saying she's the most watchable thing to me in Ozark. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I like Truman Show a lot. It, for me, it's one of those movies where I had a similar experience to you where you you watch it and you expect something totally different where like with this movie and having like the expectations of Jim Carrey movies that I had coming from like Dumb and Dumber and um, I don't know, me, myself and Irene might have been after this, I think, but uh, Ace Ventura, that sort of stuff. Like I didn't like this movie the first time I watched it, right? Because I was right. like, well, that wasn't funny. Yeah. <laughs> And I had a lot of reaction to to actors doing this thing, like Adam Sandler and Punch Drunk Love. I had the same reaction the first time I saw that movie. But having rewatched it, you know, after that, once I knew what I was in for, it, it's it's one of those movies that gets better every time I watch it. And like, <laughs> there's no there's no bigger change to me than when like a movie that I, I absolutely don't like it, and then I watch it again. I was like, well, I was completely wrong, <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah, it's it's good. Yeah. I, I really love The Truman Show, and I get goosebumps uh, just thinking about it sometimes. So Nice. I love a movie that can do that. Yeah, for sure. Especially that last shot, you know. Anyways. Uh, all right. Unless you guys have anything else, let's move on to number six. Let's go for it. Yeah. All right. Number six is 
<laughs> well, it's my third Steven Spielberg project. He didn't direct this one, so you can tell like how I spent my youth um, <laughs> watching a lot of Steven Spielberg stuff um, and like what decade I grew up in. But this movie is a trilogy, and I actually watched the second one first because I was like, my mom rented the second one, and I was like at an age where like I was just beginning to comprehend like TV and movies and stuff like that. I remember it happening. But she was so eager that she wanted to watch the second one, and she didn't necessarily know that it would mess me up. But then I remember the next day going back and watching Back to the Future, the first one, <laughs> and just absolutely loving it. <laughs> you know, like, this is another one that the score is so, you know, it's John Williams again, but it's so instrumental to making this movie what it is. Um, Michael J. Fox, I think, is putting in a good performance. I mean, I don't know that it's necessarily a tough performance for him to put into, but um, Christopher Lloyd is really great in this as the doc. I think is this there, is this Back to the Future 1 or 2? Oh, Back to the Future 1 is the, okay. the movie. I'm, That's yeah. what I thought. I just, I wanted to clarify. Yeah, absolutely. I appreciate that. Um, the doc has like probably one of the best reactions <laughs> in all of cinema. Uh, you know, like uh, I, I, will pause the movie to see his face. And that's, you know, like when his, they're in the, uh, the shop and like something catches on fire and he's like, Wah! and his face does this <laughs> weird thing. That's really funny. Um, but yeah, I think Christopher Lloyd's great in this. And of course we got, uh, late, late L- Leah Thompson, uh, who's good, does, does what she needs to do. And then, uh, we also have, um, <laughs> <laughs> she, she gets the job done. She gets the job done. <laughs> but yeah, uh, <laughs> As a kid watching this movie, it was so exciting and kind of started, you know, me loving film and loving cinema and trying to watch more things like this. So, yeah, uh, Back to the Future. I I love it. And unashamedly. (laughs) Yeah, uh, Back to the Future is awesome. I used to watch Back to the Future 1, 2, and 3, like all the time, really. Like it's it was kind of like the Indiana Jones trilogy or the Star Wars trilogy. Which is like, Mm -hmm. it kind of already existed as an entire unit by the time I became aware of it. Mm -hmm. So I have no memory of like watching one at a time. It's all just kind of blends together. So even now, I still have a hard time remembering exactly what happens in which one. One is by far the best. Oh, Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. One is good. But I think two is still pretty awesome uh, for like recreating the scenes from one. I I, had never seen a movie do that to that point. You know, now you can yeah. go watch like Endgame and it's like, ooh, cool. But, <laughs> but before we just had Back to the Future and it was it was rad. Yeah, I recently rewatched one and two. I haven't gotten to three yet, but I think one is so good that going to two, I was like, oh, two's kind of OK. Yeah, yeah. I haven't seen like, it since I was a it's, kid. It's pretty rough in some spots, I think. Like, but but that's it's partially because one is like complete like movie perfection and it's so fun and a lot simpler like back to the future 2 kind of ups the ante where we're going to the future and there's someone from way in the future who is now way in the past and we're revisiting all of these things and like it gets very complex and i don't know kind of ruins some of the fun and it gets it's actually actually pretty dark too and like kind (laughs) of like creepy (laughs) and less fun yeah agreed i think Back to the Future 1 is so simple, uh, even though it's a time travel movie. Uh, Back to the Future 2 falls into the trap of like what typical time travel movies fall into. You know, it gets complicated, things get wacky. Um, while it's still fun to watch, uh, it's just a little bit like... And it's also doing stuff where it's like setting up the third one because they filmed them back to back. So there's kind of, kind of like a couple of extra things in there that didn't necessarily need to be in there because they're setting up the third one. But mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll never look at or wear a pair of Calvin Klein underwear without thinking of this movie. Exactly, <laughs> <laughs> it's wonderful. It is. All right. So that was my first five. Uh, Let's do a recap. Yeah. yeah, I'll do a recap real quick. Uh, so number ten was Duel. Number nine was Train Spotting. Number eight was Jurassic Park. Number seven was The Truman Show. And number six was Back to the Future. Nice. Handsome so far. Yeah. And now we get a little bit different. I think things, like some of these are much better in quality. You know, like Back to the Future is great. 
But these are like kind of the staples of cinema to a certain extent. But my first one is, or not my first one, but number five is a film that I first watched uh, because I was in college and I had been introduced to Akira Kurosawa. And this was kind of my first introduction into f older foreign films. And there are other ones that I watched in at around the same time. But this one was probably the most accessible and like a good first step into watching foreign films in general. And that's Yojimbo. It, it feels very Western and it feels like it's easier, easily accessible to a Western viewer as opposed to like perhaps Ozu or some of the other uh, foreign films. But it's really hard to say anything new about this film. But Toshiro Mifune in this film is magnetic you know you can't take your eyes off of him i know it's played later by clint eastwood you know in the same you know in a remake of this but toshio mifune is i think better than clint eastwood in like especially his mannerisms like add this whole layer to this character that that gives it much more depth um i love the way kurosawa shoots film and how things are all in focus and uh once again the music to this film is uh, astounding and really great. I'm, I'm sure we've all seen this one. Um, what do you guys think? I mean, yeah, you're absolutely right. The first thing that comes to mind whenever I think of this movie um, are the opening titles with the music and the drums mm -hmm. uh, and the big white letters um, coming on the screen. And, and uh, it, Kurosawa's movies feel different, like the, like the black and white, the the scope of it. I don't know. It uh, they just have this quality that just feels. Um, it's like expertise in filmmaking. Yeah, yeah I <laughs> yeah. guess that's what it is. It's just skill is the feeling I guess I'm describing. Yeah, you can just feel that this is a step above and that you're watching something really great with basically all of his movies, or at least most of them, most of the ones I've seen, which I haven't seen all of them yet. Um, I have seen Yojimbo, and I think that the thing for me, like when I first watched this, it was also when I was first getting into foreign film and older film. And I think the thing that kind of, let me know that I was going to be in for something good was I think it's maybe the first shot of the movie and maybe it's the second, but the, um, the dog running through the town, just carrying yeah, the, the, like the severed hand in his mouth. Yeah. And I was like, so great. okay, <laughs> this is the tone yeah. here. All right. I'm, I'm in now you've hooked me. <laughs> right. It's yeah. such a, a great I, setup too. It's not going to be like some tame old movie, you know? <laughs> right. It'll be an untamed old movie. That's right. <laughs> yeah. I actually like Sanjuro better, but Do I you? I still love Yojimbo quite a bit. But Sanjuro, I think that's like the funnier of the two. Yeah, I would say it's funnier. Uh, I haven't revisited Sanjuro in quite a bit. Oftentimes when I revisit those two movies, I go to Yojimbo first. Uh, and I oftentimes don't go back to Sanjuro. <laughs> but I need <laughs> to check it out again. Yeah. Do yourself a favor. It's good. It has a wild climax. And that's what yeah. I remember about yeah. Sanjuro. That's I've only seen that <laughs> once, but I, I've seen Yojimbo three or four times. Yeah, I, wonder I think why that I've is. seen Sanjuro twice and Yojimbo three times. Yeah, nice. And then Fistful of Dollars like five times. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I I think I watched Yojimbo a couple of times together because uh, for a uh, spaghetti western class that I was taking in uh, film school when I was in grad school, uh, I the last like assignment was to do an essay over some film or whatever some topic having to do with spaghetti western so i chose to do like a video essay comparing yojimbo and fistful of dollars so that's where like two of my viewings came from nice, nice. yep a lot of fun where's that essay it's on my vimeo it's actually public but it's not <laughs> that good i had to make it like a certain length to meet the requirements for the paper and it was way longer than what it what needed to like what i needed to tell that story right <laughs> so i really like padded the thing out with slow zooms on pictures and like spaghetti western like you, you know like fistful of dollar score and stuff like that mm -hmm. <laughs> so it's a, it's not very watchable but it's all right my, my professor loved it so maybe it's okay <laughs> we can put a link to it in the show notes i i, I give permission even though it's slightly okay. embarrassing I might do that. Because <laughs> I'm narrating it, and I don't, <laughs> I don't like hearing that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. All right. <laughs> we can move on. All right. So my number four pick, I think 
this director's shown up on all three of our lists, and it both speaks to the time that we grew up and also <laughs> how great this director is, that we could each pick a different movie of his, and that's Punch Drunk Love. Nice. Yeah, I love Punch Drunk Love. Uh, we recently did an episode on it. Actually, yeah, Justin was just on War Starts at Midnight uh, and talked about Punch Drunk Love on there. And uh, Chris Gallagher was on our episode when we reviewed it. But this movie is so simple the first time you watch it. Like, it's a simple, like, romantic love story, uh, fairy tale. But, like, upon further viewings of this movie, this movie is so complicated. Uh, at least shooting it you know there is a scene where barry egan and um oh, what's the girl's name lena leonard lena leonard are walking down uh, the sidewalk and it's like this balletic uh movement that's happening because there's a giant semi truck behind them and as they turn the corner the semi truck turns the corner and it's just so beautiful like in that moment you know like everything as they fall in love is coming together and vice versa as you know Barry Egan is dealing with all this pressure everything is mounting and coming down on him in such a way and it it's more than just in the story it's in the way it's filmed and in the sound design of the film uh in you know because especially in those uh, moments where everything's coming down on him there's the noise just keeps ratcheting up and ratcheting up and you can feel the pressure that you, you know Barry Egan is dealing with especially with his sisters and everything that's happening in it and the score um, is just going crazy yeah it sounds like it's there's hammering going on and yeah, I don't know it's it's insane and then on top of that it's just this beautiful love story that will melt your heart <laughs> I recently just saw this in the theater um, again in the last year and I mean, it's so great. And I like, it. you know, it almost it leaves me speechless is what I'll say. But um, the the color in this movie, like the fact that someone can do a the there's a theory on this movie that Barry Egan plays Superman and there's so much you can read into it. You know, uh, he's like a Charlie Chaplin character in here, too. So it's so great. I love it. So, yeah, I'm sure you guys love it, too. Uh <laughs> What more do you have to add? I think for me, uh, you know, I mentioned it a second ago, it was one of those movies I didn't like the first time, but this one I've watched countless times because I yeah. fell in love with it once I, you know, got into film a little bit more and understood cinema a little bit better and was into Paul Thomas Anderson. Like I watched the film again and just fell head over heels with it. Uh, I think one of the things that makes it so rewatchable is like the theories, is the little touches like, you know, putting the semi truck. I think it's the same semi truck whenever he he picks up the harmonium for the first time. Mm -hmm. It's the same brand of semi truck whenever he they're walking and it's like rounding the corner with them, right? Mm -hmm. So putting things like that, all of like the lens flares. I, I've heard like theories that have to do with the lens flares and uh, Lena Leonard being an alien. <laughs> yeah, you know, <laughs> I, I don't know, know how much the credibility there is to that one but and, and i think it just deserves like commending for getting like far and away the best adam sandler performance out there uh i don't know i think uncut gems is better but up until uncut gems came out i would agree with you yeah okay that's <laughs> i like this movie better than uncut gems but i think technically speaking i think adam sandler is on another level in uncut gems yeah, that's true. I, I think maybe that that statement is out of habit because Uncut Gems is new and hasn't like entered my brain yeah. permanently yeah. yet. Yeah. Yeah. And since two thousand three that statement yeah. has been undisputable. Yeah. <laughs> I think um or indisputable. Punch Drunk Love is almost like a deconstruction of Adam Sandler's like public persona, you know, like in all the other movies that he's been in, because he always plays like this guy that's got this anger beneath him, like in Happy Gilmore and stuff like that. So I Punch Drunk Love is him kind of playing a deconstructed version of the other characters that he's uh, played previous <laughs> to this, so if that makes sense. So he's not necessarily stretching himself too far, like he does in Uncut Gems. <laughs> he's he's like, kind he's of like playing if Billy it. Madison wasn't rich. Yeah, yeah. exactly. The, the water boy wasn't like socially challenged. <laughs> yeah, well, I guess Barry Although Egan's he is pretty Barry socially, socially yeah. challenged, isn't he? Never <laughs> but, mind. Yeah, in a very more, a much more realistic way. Um but yeah, I, I remember like 
the, when you guys were living in Nacogdoches, I came down there for some reason. I think we were filming something, but you I just remember kept just following us around. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I was you just like, "Hey, guys, I'm here." Yeah, but I remember talking to you guys and just going to certain scenes in this movie and then like rewatching them, like the truck scene and uh, all those scenes over again. And I, I, yeah, it's just it's so great, and there's so much like thought and um care that's put into this movie that you can just tell you know and it's it's yeah i love it yeah I, and one other thing i think this movie to me one of the things i love about it is it has this sort of like punk rock attitude towards filmmaking that reminds me a lot of uh, jean-luc godard whose pierre lefeau was on my list um and one of the things i love about that movie is just sort of this and and godard in general is he had this sort of like disregard for conventional filmmaking and always wanted to like push the boundaries and I mm-hmm. think Paul Thomas Anderson is sort of approaching it with that very like rough around the edges approach in this. Like there's definitely the camera shakes that he could have done another take on, or maybe there was a take with a smoother camera shake, but he opted for like maybe better performance and left the camera shake in. Uh, there's out of focus moments, like in the the scene where Barry's talking to the, the phone sex operator. Uh, there's also weird camera movements in that scene. I think the, the, blatant choreography of the scene that we've been talking about with the semi truck and also the fact that you can tell that there's a light on top of it that's lighting the characters <laughs> and um the other big one to me is the scene where barry beats up the bathroom yeah the the audio is just overblown and sounds horrible and any other movie you would like foley that out and make it sound good but he just leaves that bad audio in there and he leaves these weird like camera bumps and like imperfections in this movie that, I think that, that I that, love. Yeah, for sure. There's a moment in the, the sex operator scene where the camera, I think, bumps into a lamp and the lamp becomes like, so when it pulls back, the lamp is like cattywampus. It's like at an angle, uh, the lampshade is. And I think that kind of stuff is part of what leads to all the theorizing because like, was it intentional or wasn't it? You know, like, uh, because everything else, there's so much else in this movie that is so intentional, uh, and so thought through, or it feels that way. So when there is something that may have just been a mistake and they leave it in like that, it leads to, well, was it a mistake or was it something that they meant to do? And they're trying to say something deeper, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And it's, it's interesting for Paul Thomas Anderson, especially looking at him coming off of something as technically astounding as Boogie Nights and Magnolia, and then going on after this film to do something as precise and technical as There Will Be Blood that doesn't have any of those like blemishes on it. It's like yeah. kind of perfection in a way. And um, and yeah, and, and There Will Be Blood was on my list, but this movie, Punch Drunk Love, it was between those two. And I was yeah. like, I got to put a Paul Thomas Anderson film on here. I got to pick only one. I don't want to have two on here. <laughs> and uh, it was a lot of debate between this movie and There Will Be Blood. Well, I'm glad you didn't put this movie on there. Uh, the other thing I like about this film, just as this is more about Paul Thomas Anderson as, as a whole, I feel like this is a bridge between, you know, Magnolia, Boogie Nights, uh, into kind of his more, like, more modern take on filming and where it's much more precise or... Uh, a period piece but there's something different between there will be blood and magnolia and boogie nights and even like the master and even phantom threads there's they feel like a different director almost as opposed to those earlier films that he did does that make sense and do you guys agree yeah um i mean yeah every director i think goes through stages like that though we're like yeah, um, sure. i mean i think like tarantino's movies haven't felt the same since the 90s either you know like i you yeah. know so it's like i think uh as these young directors grow up and their filmmaking starts to t- kind of like naturally follow their own interests of where they're at in life mm-hmm. um it seems like pt anderson has uh, here lately been into the idea of taking like um taking like a regular film and then deconstructing it somehow and doing something different with it. Like normal narrative is not interesting to him lately. I think Phantom Thread was maybe like a step more towards like a traditional narrative, but like the master uh, and certainly inherent vice. Yeah. It's uh, it's almost like he's, he's just trying to, I don't know, do what he thinks is interesting and does not seem to care about uh, general audiences at, at all. <laughs> Mm-hmm. which this movie i think you could say is similar in a way 
Oh, yeah, I think all of his movies have kind of been that way to an extent. Punch Drunk Love, I think Inherent Vice and The Master, I think, are the ones that really strike me as the most out there as far as like yeah. tone, where he's uh, really challenging the audience to to meet him halfway or more. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, for sure. All right. So my third movie is a movie that wouldn't have been on this list probably a year ago. Uh, I had watched it a long time ago, and I probably had watched it like on a bad VHS copy. And I'd watched the whole thing, and I kind of moved on. But then we actually did an episode on this movie, and it (laughs) really stuck with me. Uh, And I really haven't stopped thinking about it since. I actually did another uh, a cinemas podcast. Uh, I did an episode on that. It's uh, this movie is Tokyo Story by uh, Ozu. The second time watching this, I um, really appreciated the simplicity of the camera work, and I don't necessarily think that it's like the camera work is actually simple. But he just kind of sets the camera down and lets you observe what's happening in these rooms uh, with these people and. Uh, There's something that let, and it, by doing that, I think that he really lets the story shine through and really kind of lets you, you feel like a member of the family when you watch it like that. And when he sets the camera down and just lets you watch, I I think the conversation that we had when we made the podcast uh, on Tokyo Story was also (laughs) pretty eye opening and eye like revealing. And so I, you know, I appreciate you guys uh, talking uh, afterwards. So make sure you guys go check out that uh, that podcast because it's really good, and I, I I really enjoyed talking about it afterwards. And then, but this movie is one that like is a reminder of death, <laughs> right? And our more own mortality. And there's there's something that's really haunting about that, and that's stuck with me. And like reminds me to check in with my my parents like once a week if, if that makes sense <laughs> and um yeah I, I i really love this film it's beautiful to watch you know i i said that the camera is really simple but there are some moments you know like i'm thinking of the two parents staring off into the sea when they're at the the spa or whatever like mm-hmm. there, there are moments or like when the grandma is talking to the young kid and it's also heartbreaking but she's like i, I probably won't see who you will or like i probably won't see who you will be when you grow up and it's just heartbreaking and coming to that realization of mortality. And it's, it's really fascinating and something that like, maybe I'm working through it myself right now. I'm, uh, you know, like of a certain age, you know, like middle age, maybe I'm going through my middle life, uh, my midlife crisis right now. So maybe that's what's going on, but (laughs) (laughs) I really love this film and I, I won't, ever forget it you know like it'll always be in the back of my mind haunting me yeah. um, well, it's, it's it's a decent midlife crisis film you know it's like this and uh, wild hogs if you're gonna have one <laughs> yeah um, <laughs> this would so, be a great double feature well yeah i mean you're right this movie does perfectly capture the um the sadness of the human condition right like we we live and our life is like the center of our universe until we're old. Right. And then we're realizing that like, there's nothing on the horizon anymore. You're closer to the end. Uh, this person that you've spent decades with and taken care of, and has been the center of your, you know, worldview, uh, is dead. (laughs) You know, like Mm -hmm. there's this, it captures the, Oh, so I guess this is, this is it kind of feeling of life, right? Like you work and you work Mm -hmm. and you work and you hope that you get to be, an old married couple who, you know, gets to retire and grow old together and have kids. Like that's like the dream, right? But then it goes to show you that when you're actually there and living in the moment and the end is there, uh, you know, those things maybe aren't as cool as you dream they would be one day. <laughs> I don't know. There's a certain sadness in Tokyo story that, yeah, that you're right. It's, it, it's something you almost have to just like kind of reckon with. And then, that you know one day uh you know if you're lucky you will be old and you wonder what (laughs) kind of thoughts you are going to be having and like what what's going to be important to you and who will you be important to if anyone yeah yeah i think there's a a certain element of it doesn't matter who you are or where you are in life life can be disappointing like it's it can be other things and i think this movie kind of focuses on how life can be disappointing and 
not what you expected. And yeah, and that's hard to deal with, you know, like, uh, because we work and we live and we're like, we have dreams of what we want to do. And even sometimes when you achieve those dreams, uh, living in that dream can be disappointing. Yeah, you know? that's what the entirety of Mad Men is about. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's also something important about gaining perspective in life, right? And And what is so great about this film is that it, to me at least, gave me some perspective. You know, it made me think, like you I think you said, Mike, that it makes you think like, what, when I'm old, am I going to have these thoughts? What's it going to be like for me? And it makes you kind of look ahead and that looking ahead gives you perspective on where you are now. And there is something about this movie that I think makes you want to be a better person and a better, like, mm -hmm. yeah, a, you know, better to your, to your parents. Not that, you know, you're necessarily bad to your parents even, but it just makes you want to like call them more often or, you know, spend more time with family or, you know, appreciating the ones you have, like the loved ones you have while they're here. And to that extent, it's not totally a sad, like just trudge movie, you know? Yeah. It's bittersweet. I think it's more of like the thinking man's kind of sad. Yeah. <laughs> it's not like you're going to cry, but you're going to, you're going to contemplate life. That's yeah. just something you're going to have to do after seeing Tokyo Story, I think. Yeah. And we did this podcast episode that Chris mentioned because we were doing films that like each of us chose a film we hadn't seen before. And Tokyo Story was this giant blind spot that I've been wanting to see for probably over a decade and just had never got around to it. So I've only seen this film once and that was, you know, for our podcast episode. So I haven't had that, that chance to really like watch it again and dive into it. But that, first viewing like was really powerful. So I, I could see myself mm -hmm. after I have watched this film a couple more times, this could really fly up the list. I think, you know, fly up my personal list. Yeah. It's a beautiful yeah. movie. Good, good at number three, Chris. Good job. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Also, uh, I, I also real quick, I want to say this is the film that I knew would be on this list way earlier in the episode when I said that. Oh, so oh, I think it was punch that's surprising. that you knew. No, it That's was, it was Tokyo knew. Story because I guess I, I heard Chris, you know, talk about it on our episode and then talk about it on the Cinemust episode that he was on. And I think that he said something similar in those episodes of like, you know, the movie, these movies have had a profound effect on me or whatever. Yeah. And um, I know Tokyo Story is that, so. I, I would have guessed that it would have been my number one that you would have guessed, but we'll, oh. we'll, we'll get, get there soon. Wow. Um, We're almost there. Yeah. Yeah, almost. So. All right. My number two movie is uh, was really my introduction to Christopher Nolan. And this is also the movie that I've seen the most times in theaters, like uh, Justin talked about there would be blood was the uh, because after I saw Memento, I had to take all my friends to go see this. And, you know, I take like one friend and go see it. And then I'd go get another friend and be like, oh, you've got to see this. And so I saw it so many times and it's a, it's a puzzle box movie. And one of the things that's interesting and I think that kind of changed how I looked about films because it's kind of one of the things that like needs to be on this list is is the way it structures its story. Obviously, <laughs> it moves backwards. Uh, and then there's like a, a colored segment that you don't necessarily know uh, where you are in the movie with the color segment, but it uh, is in black and white, moves backwards, and then it cuts back and forth between these color segments. I think Guy Pierce gives a really great performance. And uh, also Carrie Ann Moss and um, oh, what is his name? Joe pa pa Pantoliano um, before the Matrix, they before they teamed up in the Matrix. This is one of those movies just like Tokyo Story, but in a different way that I after I, I went and saw this in Dallas with a friend. And I remember the whole way back, you know, just talking about it and like putting the pieces together. Um, th there's a certain aspect of. I know that there's like kind of maybe plot holes to this film, but when I first saw it, I didn't necessarily care. Um, and my mind was blown. <laughs> and there's there's a a quality to having your mind blown because I don't think that happens very often. At least it doesn't anymore uh, in films and stuff. But you, you really got a treasure, you know, like uh, when you're like, whoa, I did not see that coming. And, and I really appreciate that in Memento. Um, yeah, uh, I've been a big fan of Christopher Nolan ever since. Uh, there's some of his movies that I'm I'm not as big of a fan of, but uh, I I certainly like. You ever find the director when he first starts and you're like, 
this guy, uh, like Ryan Johnson was one of those. I watched Brick and you're like, this guy, I'm going to follow him like and see what he does next. And, I, you know, like I, I kind of don't even care if it's good or bad. I just want to follow him. You know, does that make <laughs> sense? Uh, so yeah. anyways, yeah. Memento is my number two. And that was actually written by Jonathan Nolan, right? Correct. Uh, it was based on like a short story that he had done called Memento More, okay. uh, I believe. Um, I don't know if it was a collaboration between the two of them. But yeah, Jonathan Nolan uh, definitely had a hand in this. Yeah, it feels a lot like, like a lot of similar themes that I like in like Westworld. I can feel uh, his style kind of yeah, in this screenplay. I, <laughs> this definitely works better than Westworld. <laughs> well, it's a movie. It's a lot easier to probably, yeah. I imagine, yeah. to make uh, two really good hours of content versus like 30 28 really good hours of content <laughs> that is very true how do you guys feel about memento because i i i'm pretty sure that you guys <laughs> don't appreciate it as much as i do uh and not why? as much as you do i like it i haven't seen it to be honest with you since like the dvd days mm -hmm. so it's probably been since 2007 2006 since i've even really thought about memento for very much uh i guess i I liked it, but I like other Christopher Nolan movies more, I think. Um, I like Following quite a bit mm -hmm. and Inception. One. I think those are my favorite. And then I guess The Prestige, I think, are probably my favorite Christopher Nolan movies. But um, there's absolutely nothing wrong with Memento. And I remember it's actually really creative and fun. And I always kind of have a soft, uh, a soft spot for Guy Pierce. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Guy Pierce is LA great. Confidential is actually on my list. So, yeah. Oh, man. LA Confidential. I'm not on my list. Yeah, that almost was. made my top ten. I'm not. I'm, I'm no. not even kidding you. Uh, or maybe it's my top twenty. I love LA Confidential. I watched that like earlier this year, or last yeah. year. Yeah, it's it's funny that you bring it up because over dinner I was just talking to my fiance. She wanted me to make a list of like really you know popular movies that are kind of those like everyone's like, oh, you haven't seen this? I can't believe you've not seen that. And one of them that I thought of was Memento, which yeah, you know, it's it's obviously not as important as like. Schindler's List or <laughs> something like that, right? <laughs> but uh, it came to mind as just one of those real popular movies. Maybe it's the time that I grew up in because this movie was very popular. I saw it everywhere mm -hmm. and a lot of people were talking about it. And that that's around the time that I watched it. But that was also the last time I watched it was around the time that it came out. What When was that? Like 2005 or six? Two, 2000 is when it came out. Oh my gosh. Well, okay. that's I saw it in like 2005. <laughs> Yeah, that's what no, I was saying. I, I saw it, was it on the DVD new. days. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, anyways, but I haven't seen it since then. And, you know, Christopher Nolan is kind of hit or miss. And it's one I'm less familiar with. So I've been really wanting to rewatch it. So I'm hoping that I can convince her to to rewatch it soon. And uh, I think I sold her on it. But, you know, it's um, it's a movie that I remember just being pretty confused by, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and and it's possibly because at, at that time in my life, like 2005, I wasn't one to sit there and watch movies in a very analytical way. And I was probably distracted and talking to other people, whoever I was with. And you know what I mean? Like kind of half paying attention to it, half hanging out with friends while it's on. Yeah. Doing that, that sort of that'll thing. Do it. Yeah. Uh, I think this is a movie and at risk of like looking dumber than I actually am, but, uh, or maybe not, Dumber than I actually am, but I, this is a movie I had to piece together. You know, like uh, I, like upon second and third viewings, like I, I started to put it together. Does that make sense? The first one was well, still satisfying. Yeah, the first viewing was satisfying, and I, I got enough out of it to be satisfied by the movie. It's not like Blue Velvet or you know uh, Mulholland Drive or something like that, which are satisfying, but in a very different way. But yeah, so. I did have to piece it together over like a couple of viewings is what I would say. Also, I just want to say uh, Dunkirk is up there among my top Christopher Nolan films. <laughs> yeah. I forgot that movie existed for a minute. <laughs> Thank you. Dunkirk's uh, really great. And I also want to say I know what Chris's number one movie is now. All right. Yeah. Well, then let's get there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. If we're done with Memento, I just I had to say it while there was a break. <laughs> nah, I think we've lost the momentum on Memento. No, oh, fair enough. I quit. Yeah, I'm taking your oh. job, Chris. <laughs> you can't yeah. quit now. You're going to leave us all hanging. Actually, I know what it is, so I can just tell everyone what it was yeah. if you quit. Yeah, Justin, <laughs> yeah, what's Chris's number one? <laughs> <laughs> all right. Um, 
My number one movie is also one that I wanted to share with everybody when I first watched it. I actually watched it on accident. <laughs> uh, like I went, I remember I went to Blockbuster and I was trying to watch Psycho um, because I thought Jimmy Stewart was in Psycho, and mm-hmm. uh, I like went to the movie theater or to blockbuster and i was like oh there's an alfred hitchcock movie with jimmy stewart and i was like described and they, they gave me vertigo and this is a movie that's kind of a miracle that i loved it as much as i did um when i first watched it and i was young at the time but it's got a slow start i think uh but it draws you in I remember thinking when I first watched it that about halfway through this movie that the movie was over. I was like, oh, this is a really dark ending. And then it keeps going. And the second half uh, blew me away. And it's a beautifully shot movie. Um, Like there's single shots that like like a Kim Novak standing in front of the Golden Gate Bridge. You know, it's it's iconic. You know, you can't get away from it. Like it's one of the. Uh, best shots you know best shot films at least for Hitchcock I think uh, it's my favorite of the ones I've seen of his Uh, Bernard Herrmann uh, his score is great this is another one that I bought the uh, uh, soundtrack to Um, I I just you know (laughs) there's these movies that like were both kind of like a turning point and like showed me like oh Older movies can be something completely different than what I thought, and they can be darker. They can be, um, they're not all like Andy Griffith show, (laughs) you know, does that make sense? Uh, (laughs) They can deal with these themes that are um, adult, but in a a very different way than I was used to uh, in modern cinema. Does that make sense? And... Yeah, and I love it. And I love it for showing me that. And I know, like, uh, Justin, you and I got to go see this uh, at, I don't know, it was like the Angelica. Like, uh, I took mm-hmm. you to go see it, but I would, like, went and showed all my friends, you know, like, I, uh, yeah. Anyways, I love mm-hmm. this film. Um, and yeah, it's great. What do you guys think? Well, real quick, since you mentioned it, yeah, you invited me to go see this movie with you. And of course, I had never seen it. It was when I was. I think first starting to work at Blockbuster, or maybe I hadn't quite started working there, but Mike, you had, so we all kind of knew each other and were hanging out. Mm-hmm. And this was also like when I was first getting into films and very similar to you, like you, you basically took the words out of my mouth is like, this is one of the first older movies I actually sat down and gave my attention to partly because we went and saw it in a theater and I couldn't mm-hmm. like distract myself or, or whatever, you know? So actually sitting down and paying attention to this movie is like is the reason that I got into older film from that point on. Like this was the film that like made me open my eyes and want to watch anything older than like the 1990s or maybe 1980s. <laughs> right. Yeah. Uh, everything before that I was, I was convinced everything older was boring, you know, quaint, whatever. And uh, this movie is like, it is suspenseful. It is creepy. It shocked me. And surprised me. I had no idea where it was going. Mm-hmm. You know, like you said, halfway through the movie, you think it's over. And then the ter- the story kind of takes a twist from there. And I'm like, in my head, I'm like, wait a minute. We've already kind of gone through what I thought were the main beats of the story. Where do we go from here? And, right. you know, I this movie is very close to making my top 10 for that reason. Because without it, I wouldn't have seen a lot of the older films that were on my top 10. Or, you know, in that, in my honorable mentions or even just movies that didn't make the list that I love too. Like this movie is responsible for that. So thank you so much for ever making me go see this movie <laughs> with you. Um, even though I've heard some people like point out some flaws in it that I kind of have some things like hard to argue with, you know, I can't really argue with them, but I think just sitting there and enjoying the ride of this movie is for, like for the first time is just an experience I'll never forget. Yeah. Always hold a special I, place in my heart. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I, I think it's kind of a miracle that I made it through the first time, you know, like, because that the first, because I watched it at home. I mean, I, I didn't have a cell phone or anything at the time, but I watched it at home and it's a slow beginning. And I, like, I look back on that time. I'm like, how did I make it through that? You know, like uh, I, I would sit down and watch movies, but I, I don't know. I'm just kind of surprised that I did. <laughs> but yeah, Mike, uh, how do you feel about Vertigo? Oh, yeah. I mean, Vertigo is great. 
I don't know if this was one of my first Hitchcock films or not. I think the first one that I watched uh, and like started to really like whenever I was a little kid was The Birds. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then I think I saw Psycho. I think Vertigo was like my third. So I had already had my mind opened to how good Alfred Hitchcock could be. Uh, but yeah, no, this movie's great. I think this is one of Jimmy Stewart's best performances. Yeah, I was just about to ask you guys that. Is is this his best performance? I don't know if it's his best, but I think this is the one where he's like, he's put to the best use. <laughs> I think yeah. this is like his most risky performance compared to a lot of his other films. Agreed, that's what I was about to say. I mean, like, kind of later in his career, he started doing things that were a little bit more... You know, like they weren't It's a Wonderful Life or Mr. Smith Goes to Washington. Like his, he was playing a little bit of a darker character in this. And then like I think The Naked Spur was one as well. And maybe even The Man Who Shot Liberty Valance. I don't know. Yeah, really it's like remember. Man Who Shot Liberty yeah. Valance. But even this is a little darker than his character yeah. in that. His character yeah. in that I mean, just wasn't the hero. Yeah. I mean, this is about like uh, some dark and weird stuff, you know, like – uh you know, it's about sexual obsession and like trying to change this girl. And I didn't realize – oh. I guess that's kind of spoilery. I won't say anymore. Yeah. It, it's creepy, and he is the bad guy. <laughs> he is a bad guy in the movie. Yeah. Like I, I know that there are other things. Like I don't want to spoil the movie for anybody. Like he's maybe not like the villain necessarily, but he's kind of not a good dude for a decent chunk of the movie. And that's something I don't really associate with Jimmy Stewart. Yeah, he's definitely scarred, and and that scarring makes him do things that are not optimal <laughs> <laughs> no very, suboptimal very troublesome yeah but that's what like captivated me the first time i saw it was just it went to these super dark weird unexpected places and you know one of the last like things that happened in the movie there's there's this one shot where i was just kind of like you know what the heck is going on? What is about to happen in this movie? <laughs> and yeah, I just, it just floored me for like five seconds until you kind of realize what's going on. And um, I'll never forget that, I, that moment of like shock and genuine shock, like shock more than like most modern movies have ever shocked me. Yeah, for sure. It's a mind blowing moment. Cool. Well, anybody got anything else on Vertigo? No. Oh. I think we should do a recap. Yeah. Lay yeah, it, all right. Lay them on us. Um, all right. So number 10 is Duel. Number nine is Train Spotting. Number eight is Jurassic Park. Number seven is The Truman Show. Number six is Back to the Future. Number five is Yojimbo. Number four is Punch Drunk Love. Number three is Tokyo Story. Number two, Memento. Number one is Vertigo. Nice. Nicely done. You know, to list off uh, some of my runners up. I would love to hear those. Yeah. 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 All right. So kind of in no particular order, but some of the ones that I listed was Old Boy, uh, Magnolia. I was on there too. L.A. Confidential, Band of Outsiders, just barely didn't make it. Mm -hmm. Uh, Glengarry Glenn Ross uh, Mm. was was on there. Stagecoach, uh, Bob LaFlambeau. Bula, how do you pronounce that? Uh, the Limey and uh, Little Miss Sunshine. <laughs> nice. Uh, just da- barely didn't make it. Yeah. Good. That's a that's a good runner up list. I think I've seen most of those. There are actually some that I haven't though. Yeah, I haven't seen the uh, I haven't seen the Limey. Limey is really good. It's a good Steven Soderbergh, and it kind of actually introduced me to like a noir type setting. You know, cool. Yeah, which I really enjoy. I haven't seen the Limey or Bob La Flambeur. Or how do you say that? Oh. Uh, it's when I yeah, it's seen. uh, it was like my first introduction to Melville, um, and th- from there I went on to Le Samurai and Le Circle Rouge and stuff like that. But I will always appreciate Bob Le Flambeur for Le introducing Rouge me to is Melville. So cool. yeah. yeah, I mean, <laughs> uh, I don't think Alan Dela- Dion Delon. How do you pronounce that guy's name? I don't know. Yeah, <laughs> your guess is uh, as good as mine. <laughs> yeah, Alan. Delon, or however you pronounce his name. Uh, he's not in Bob Le Flambeau, but he is so cool in Le Circle Rouge and Le Samurai. I want to see mean, it's like Purple Noon. Have you guys seen Purple Noon? No. The original? It's, I have not. It's like Mr. the talented Ripley. Mr. Ripley thing, right? Yeah. 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 Starring him. I have not. I have not, but he's handsome on that cover, so that Criterion cover. <laughs> <laughs> I bet he was handsome off the cover, too. Maybe. You know, yeah. I read. I, I don't know if this is true, but I heard it was him on the cover of The Smith, The Queen is Dead. Oh, really? Hmm. Mm-hmm. Jake Wagner Russell, who did our um, theme song, told me that. I'm going to look that up. 
I'm going to look that up right now. <laughs> Do it. We'll wait. Yeah, please, yeah. please. It's hard to tell, but I can certainly see it. I can see how it might be. Yeah. Are you just I looking at the it. picture or are you Googling facts? I'm just looking at the picture. I don't oh, want to Google going with facts. Your gut. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I want my own interpretation on this. I just want to believe <laughs> it or not believe it. I don't want to know. Based on you your know? gut instinct. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's how I like to live life. Okay. Well, just let us know you made your decision so we can close the show. I think it's him. I, I believe it. Okay. <laughs> I've heard it here. Justin believes it. <laughs> Therefore, it is fact. <laughs> cool. Well, does, is that it? Anybody got anything else for the show? I don't know. Chris, are you satisfied with your top 10 episode? Uh, let me change it again real quick. Let's start over. Okay. <laughs> At this time, let's go backwards in honor of Memento, though. Yeah, let's do that. That'd be fun. <laughs> nice. Um, what I will say is I feel better. You know, like I stress out about this list quite a bit. Um, but having gotten it done and gotten it out there, I feel good about it. And yeah. I actually, I, this was a good, a, a good experiment. Um, I don't know how good it is for the listeners, but I certainly had fun doing all three of these episodes. Yeah. It's a good list. You should feel good about it. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. I like every movie that I've seen, which the one I still, the, the only one I haven't seen is dual out of all three of our lists. Is it the same, same for you, Mike? Uh, yeah. Yeah. So I, I guess we should rectify had- that. Yeah. 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 Either either you, a feature review or we'll just Mike and I will both watch it and then we can have kind of an extended news on the march. We'll figure that out at some point. Yeah. Yeah. Sounds good. Cool. Well then that does it for this episode, huh? Sure does. I believe so. Awesome. Well, thank you guys so much for listening. Of course, as always, thank you, Jake Wagner Russell, for doing our intro and outro music. If you want to hear more of his music, go to soundcloud.com slash popscotch. And thanks for giving us all those fun, possible, potentially true facts about uh, the Queen is Dead cover <laughs> and Alan DeLone. All those years ago. Thank you. All right. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed these top 10 episodes. Maybe more to come if they're a hit. I don't know. Let's see. Let's get some feedback about that at those places Justin just mentioned. Stay tuned to this feed. Next week, we will be returning to our casually Criterion episodes, and we are going to do Akira Kurosawa's Stray Dog, starring Toshiro Mifune. Yay! Yeah. I, actually, Mike, I have not told people where they can find us yet, except for well, way back at the beginning of the episode. Well, you know, that's what I meant by just now. <laughs> yeah, just now is, you know, roughly he an hour and a memento. 15 minutes ago. Yeah. A memento thing. He's, he's going backwards, so he's oh. going to say that you had, and then you do it. And it's just like memento. Thank you, Mike, for honoring my list. Yeah, I understood oh. what was happening. So did Chris. Yeah. Yeah. Get with it, Justin. <laughs> this is confusing. Just like memento. Okay, fine. All right. <laughs> you can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Casual Cinecast. You can also email us at casualcinemedia at gmail.com. Thanks so much for listening, guys. Be safe out there, and we will talk to you later. Wait. Because this is like memento, we can't say goodbye. We have to say hello. Oh, let's do Hello and welcome. <laughs> Yeah, hello and welcome to the Casual Cinecast. Yeah. Hello. Hello. Welcome. <laughs>